Hi, this is Eric Schlein. You're listening to the Intelligent Investing Podcast. Before we start the show, I wanted to share a little clip from uh, today's episode. Uh, I interviewed, it was an amazing, amazing interview with a guy named Gautam Bade, who is a CFA uh, portfolio manager. The guy is wise. Um, so he wrote a book called The Joy of Compounding. And later in the interview, in our just where it wasn't like an interview, it was more just a, you know, a back and forth dialogue conversation. He talked about why the Berkshire Hathaway meeting is so valuable for people. It's it's always been something for me that's really, really hard to explain to someone who's never been there. And Gotham Bade was able to share that magic much more eloquently than I've ever been able to do. So I wanted to just play a clip from that uh, part of the episode that comes much later at the beginning. And then after that, um, we'll uh, start the show. That's very true. In fact, you know, I've talked about, uh, you know, this in the chapter on the importance of having the right associates in life. So Mm -hmm. so, just to add to your point about the impact which uh, Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting has has on us value investors, I'll just sum it up in one single line you get to experience a gravitational pull towards higher qualities. I mean, you know, Warren Buffett has famously said, hang out and interact with people better than you and you cannot improve. And that is what you get to experience every year at the Berkshire Rathway Annual Meeting. I mean, so many you know, smart, intelligent, wise people, just being in the presence has an incredible impact on, you know, the true, the truly curious and uh, humble person. I mean, you just want to imbibe all those good qualities as much as you, as you can, you know, just... You know, just take up all the good qualities that you can from all those wise people. That's what I love most about this annual meeting. And all of them, you'll also notice one more thing. Most of those, in fact, majority, if not all of them, are so, so humble and so, so helpful. I mean, you know, they have been greatly beneficial in, in my life. Greatly, greatly beneficial. And those relationships, then they really tend to endure for a long period of time. And it's not about money. It's just about, you know, being in the company of good people. That's it. Welcome to the Intelligent Investing Podcast, where modern portfolio theory can suck it. A student of the school of Graham and Doddsville and a clergy member of the Church of Warren Buffett, here's your host, Eric Schlein. Hi, this is Eric Schlein. You are listening to the Intelligent Investing Podcast. Today we have Gotham Bade on. He is a CFA portfolio manager at a Summit Global Investments and SEC a uh, registered investment advisor based out of Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, previously served at the Mumbai, London, and Hong Kong offices of both Citigroup and Deutsche Bank as senior analyst in their healthcare investment banking teams. Uh, is a C- CFA charter holder, member of the CFA Institute. Uh, got an MBA in finance from, ooh, I don't know how to pronounce this. Is it Nirma University? How do you, how do you say that? Yes, Eric, that's correct. Oh, good. Nirma University in India and an MS in finance from ICFAI University in India. Strong believer in the virtues of compounding, good karma, and lifelong learning. Welcome to the show. It's an honor to have you. Thanks, Eric. Thank you for having me. So now, word on the street is you just uh, wrote a book. Yes, that's correct. It's called The Joys of Compounding. So tell us, tell us a little bit about uh, what the book's about, what had you want to write it. Just give us a little background on this. So in its uh, true essence, the joys of compounding is my heartfelt tribute to all my teachers who helped me achieve financial independence, become a better and wiser person, and embark on, a, on the path to a meaningful and fulfilling life. And uh, writing this book is you know, more my way of giving back to the investing community. That's why I decided not to charge any royalty or fee from the sale of this book. I'm just selling this at the minimum permissible price for the paperback on Amazon and uh, other mediums like Book Depository, Books a Million, IndieBound, and other mediums. So, you know, I've gotten to learn a lot from the investing community over the years, and uh, I hope they find reading this book helpful. And and uh, as I'm aware, you're uh, with with pre-order sales. You're you're not doing too shabby, are are, are you? It's gotten a pretty good response. I'm very humbled by the response so far. Uh, it's a uh, pretty heartening. Yes. Yeah. Well, congr- congratulations on that. So, tell us tell us a little bit about um, you know for for someone who might be interested in reading the book. Tell us a little bit about what 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 the book's about. 
So essentially, the, the book uh, you know covers all the key life lessons and the investment principles that uh, power the compounding journey of a value investor. Uh, you know, the very beginning, the first chapter of the book is you know which kicks off uh, the proceedings is titled "The Best Investment You Can Make Is an Investment in Yourself," and it talks about you know the importance of uh, continuous daily self improvement, which is the best investment you can make. And uh, if you just you know keep on learning every single day if you just engage in constant learning constant improvement every single day one step one small step at a time eventually it starts uh, bearing great great results and uh, this value investing field is so vast and so so deep i mean there are so many intriguing topics uh, which are, which are worth discussing about and essentially what i've done is i've compressed all the biggest learnings of my 35 years into one single book that is essentially what the book has done so you know the, apart from the core investing uh, lessons there is a lot of uh, talk about the various uh, life principles as well for example there is you know talks about you know embracing simplicity being humble so you know, let's, engaging constant so let's go with that embracing simplicity how how, how does that apply uh, you know to to the theme of the joys of compounding and, and value investing to, Explain, explain, because I think we, I think your book's interesting because it's not just a straight up, you know, finance or business book. And I, I think um, you incorporating a lot of the different kinds of philosophy and wisdom behind it make makes the book actually quite unique. Um, so, so explain, explain, you know, embracing simplicity, how that how that ties into the to the larger uh, picture of investing. Correct. So basically, you know, one of the ch- earlier chapters before simplicity talks about the power of focus. And in the chapter on simplicity, I've talked about embracing simplicity as a way of life. And there is a section on there is a section on minimalism. So minimalism is basically not about having the minimum number of things in your life. It's about having the optimum number of things in your life. It's about basically decluttering your life away from all the excesses which you may have. So if you have, you know, too many excess insurance policy or insurance pro- products or a lot of, you know, you know, piled up or defunct stuff at on your desk or at home. You're just clearing away all the clutter from your life to bring in focus, and focus is the key to success. You know, you look you look at most of the successful people in the world. They have embraced the power of focus. In fact, there is a specific chapter on that particular topic. It's titled "Harnessing the Power of Passion and Focus Through uh, One of the Big Ideas from the Field of Behavioral Science, which is a deliberate practice." So all these, you know, each of the chapter builds on one another. And you know, by the time you are through with uh, reading all the chapters, you know, you would have, you know, just like me, you know, even, even you, and I hope all the readers would have uh, obtained a lot of wisdom. I mean, there is just so much to learn. And the beauty of embracing lifelong learning is that the more we learn, the more intellectual curiosity we cultivate, and we just want to keep learning more and more. <laughs> the more we learn, the more we learn that how much we do not know, and that's <laughs> it is such a, you know, it's just a wonderful positive virtuous cycle which is in place and. It just makes every day so so exciting, and you know I just look forward to every single day just to learn something new. It's so much fun. In fact, uh, what Charlie Munger has done is is one of the greatest thinkers of our time. He has actually trained his brain to think in such a way that when he learns something new, it releases the pleasure pleasure chemical of dopamine in his brain. So that is the way he has you know just trained his mind to think in such a manner. He derives a lot of pleasure from learning things, and once you have that kind of a mindset life just becomes so wonderful and so exciting i mean i mean some some people get uh, you know excitement from bungee jumping or other thrilling adventure people like me get thrill and excitement from discovering something new and learning something new so i guess just <laughs> let's do whatever makes us makes us very happy i think it's interesting that you you make the connection between happiness and this curiosity for learning um i i could say that i i've experienced sometimes where you know, there's people are they kind of do the opposite, where they only want to validate what they already know, and they kind of push away information that doesn't already fit into their to their box, and mm-hmm. they're kind of miserable doing that at the same time. If you think about it, right? That's very true. I mean, in, in just to take this to the world of investing, you know, the good yeah. investors do not do not try to prove themselves right all the time. They in fact keep re reevaluating why they might be wrong. Right. They are yeah. always on the they are they are always on the search for disconfirming evidence. In fact, Charlie Munger says that any year in which you have not killed your highest conviction idea is a wasted year. I mean, that is such a brilliant brilliant trick to learn. And in the book, I've shared the story about Charles Darwin. You know, even you know, even in his in his uh, you know. 
evolution you know, during this uh, this uh, building up of his evolution theory you know all the time he was you know just building up and you know looking for disconfirming evidence and whenever he used to find something which did not confirm with his uh, preconceived notions he used to immediately note it down because he mentioned that the mind has got a habit of you know just brushing aside all the disconfirming evidence so he, right. just, he actually used to note it down so all these you know, small small uh, tips and tricks which we can br- pick up from the great minds is very very helpful that's so, why you know in the, yeah Go so what, no, no, it's okay. So what, what would you say for someone? Because you, you're 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 dropping a lot of wisdom here. So I I just don't want to step over everything and, and go one thing at a time. So for someone, you know, it sounds like you're someone who's as is pretty natural at thinking in this way. You know, and I I think to be just to be um, compassionate to to the rest of humanity. There's a lot of people that have a hard time um, thinking in that way. What would you say are some ways you can train your mind to, you know, to, to how do I put it, to, to start being able to, uh, you know, break your own conclusions, think outside of uh, your, your own, you know, circle of understanding so you can expand your knowledge base. I think because everyone, I think people generally want to say they're open-minded. And then on the flip side, so many people have a really hard time taking in new information that doesn't, you know, already confirm what they already know. How would you say you could train someone to, to kind of, uh, break, break that habit of, of pushing away information outside of their comfort zone? Well, that's a very good question, Eric. And the simple answer to that is, uh, you have to embrace everlasting humility. That is the only single way you can actually embrace this uh, way of thinking because it's a very unnatural way of thinking. Humans basically have this, uh, habit of you know trying to preserve our preconceived view of ourselves we mm-hmm. always try to you know we do not see things the way the, the way they are we see we see things the way we are that's the problem so you know if you really want to see things in an objective light if you want to you know become a wise person you just have to embrace humility and you know that is the you know, most effective way to inculcate this particular thought process and it's it's a journey see a journey of a you know a long journey begins with one single step and uh, you know in the book i've talked about the you know big idea of kaizen which is basically a japanese form for taking you know small incremental positive steps so and what's the, what's that word say, say that again it is called kaizen k a i z e n kaizen so you know robert morer's book one small step can change your life it mm-hmm. is one of my all time favorite books and it talks about the power of compounding small daily positive actions and uh, if you want to improve you know you just have to begin i mean see in the chapter on achieving financial independence i, I talk about this particular fact that it's not the first million dollars that is the hardest it is the first dollar the most difficult part is getting started that is the key you know you just start just you know you know dogged incremental progress over a long period of time is the key to compounding that is what leads to incredible outsized results over time i mean my, i am a living example in the first chapter in fact i've shown a compounding chart and i've talked about it you know this is what my life experienced last year you know after so many years of determined efforts after you know repeatedly falling and getting back again just putting in the effort every single day just putting in the work you know just you know there is this big idea of uh, karma yoga from the great uh, indian literature work uh, called bhagavad gita and it uh, basically talks about you know just being detached from the fruits of the outcome just focusing on the process and the work just put in the work you know don't be you know basically we should be passionate about things that we can control not about the outcome because that is not in our control if you if we start becoming passionate about the outcome for example in in, in investing if we start obsessing over the outcome or the returns we risk becoming dejected on poor outcomes but if we are passionate about the process about you know the entire you know way of doing doing it that will lead to lasting happiness you know we should not just you know obsess about the outcome or the results you know we have to we have to be passionate about what we can control and the process is the only thing within our control and once you start uh, you, know, live, you know living in the present and enjoying the process because that is where you live and so just that is how you derive lasting happiness and that will you know just make that is what will help you put in that extra effort that is what will help you get ahead of others you know because you know how many people you know who would you know actually stay up late nights or you know actually you know reading annual reports till 2 3 am in the morning you know on certain days because they're finding it so exciting you can only do this when you're so so passionate about what you're doing and you're having a lot of fun so 
it's all a com- combination of things there is power and passion i tell you there is a tre- tremendous amount of power and passion and it's uh, very good for health health as well by the way <laughs> I, you know it, it's it's almost like if gandhi got reincarnated into you and became a value investor <laughs> you really are like well, this wise you... this wise indian uh value investing sage well uh, the uh, just to let you know uh, coincidentally the joys of compounding concludes with the with a legendary quote by uh, mahatma gandhi who had once uh, described compounding in all its glory, glory. <laughs> i hope uh, i hope readers enjoy reading that quote it's one of my all time favorites what what's the what's the quote well i cannot recall it of the on of the top of my head but just hold on for a second i think i can quickly look it up for you just give me a second Well, when I get people sneak previews of books, we go to the ending first, right? Yeah, actually, let's keep it a surprise for the okay, readers. Okay, perfect. Let them perfect, read perfect, the book, actually. Perfect. I have it in front of me, but okay. let them read it. I think they'll enjoy it. Now, are there other any... So, it's, it's, I thought it was... I think it's fascinating mm-hmm. that you bring up the um, the Bhagavad Gita. Um, it's such a you know famous, famous spiritual book uh, for good reason, too. It's, it's actually an incredible text. I, I highly recommend <laughs> anyone read it. Um, mm-hmm. And it's also, I, I have found just on a side note, it's one of the few texts where if you really spend time reading it, it's a real experience. It's not just an intellectual understanding. I mean, to really, to really get that book, it, it needs to be gotten internally as opposed to just intellectually. You know what I mean? Yep. What would, That's what, true. And that, yep. What would you say are some more connections that you've made between uh, the Bhagavad Gita and uh, value investing? so uh, there is a chapter in the book which is which talks about the virtues of philanthropy and good karma and uh, one of the most important teachings which i took away from the bhagavad gita is to develop a trusteeship attitude towards material wealth this keeps us humble and inculcates a sense of detachment in us the process of creating wealth should motivate us to give our best but the results should be surrendered for the betterment of humanity after we have taken care of our needs because we are able to create wealth only with the help of others right so giving back also needs to be a part of our planning wow. so yeah this is how you know this is how that that particular chapter begins and there are more references uh, to the bhagavad gita in the book for example you know the, i've quoted uh, ajay piramal one of the leading industrialists from india who basically talks about his his big take away from the bhagavad gita which is to be dispassionate he says that you know my biggest learning is that if you are dispassionate and objective you will win so and he has demonstrated that through his actions you know i think actions speak much more louder than words and if, as investors we want to you know ultimately you know our uh, investments should also be a reflection of our personal values as well so you know we just uh, you know it's not always about returns all the time i mean when you are you know investing you know over time it becomes highly personal and especially after you achieve financial independence you just want to side and you know partner with uh, motors and uh, you know entrepreneurs who just share you know a similar philosophy like you so it just makes life much more uh, enjoyable you know you know partnering with you know people whom you are, whom you admire and trust it just uh, makes life very happy and peaceful and uh, i think you know having achieved financial independence now i have the luxury and the freedom to actually choose those kind of investments and just peacefully compound um, so can you can yeah, you give me can you give me an ex- an example of, some, of of an investment that you've chosen in in that context Yes, uh, I just mentioned uh, Ajay Piramal for example right now. You know, mm. he's a person who you know who basically exercises complete detachment. I mean, uh, many years back he sold his uh, core you know crown jewel business of domestic formulations to Abbott for a very expensive uh, valuation, and he and even though that business was you know built up by him from scratch over the years and he had a lot of personal attachment to it, in the interest of the minority shareholders he actually. you know did what was best for them he didn't you know he didn't just you know latch on to his personal legacy he he actually did what was good and in the best interest of the minority shareholders and he got a very rich valuation he got you know and he de- then deployed the proceeds into very high growth uh, financial services business and created more value for shareholders so you know those kind those kind of uh, businesses are you know very 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 attractive and there are many and there are many more for example there is an uh, animal healthcare business also in india which i own and uh, you know they are solving a very important uh, problem of uh, you know all this animal healthcare and you know basically 
people, you know, companies like them, you know, like these, which are you know giving a good service for society and you know for overall uh, development on development of the world, you just feel good when you are partnering with partnering with them for the long term. It just feels good. So, I, I personally, I feel that you know when you are partnering with ethical promoters who are serving a good cause, you know your stress your stress adjusted returns. I mean, see, many people talk about absolute returns, right? but over time you you know as you grow older and become more mature you realize that stress stress adjusted returns are much much more important i mean how do you you know these are highest in case of businesses you know which are you know basically playing positive some games you know doing good things for society solving a critical problem ethical promoters giving good dividends you know generating good cash flow low debt you know just good you just basically partnering with good people and your stress adjusted returns are far far higher and i think sleeping well is you know equally if more if not more important than than eating well so personally that is my preference obviously individual investors have got the, have got their own preferences but for me at this stage of my life you know having uh, worked very very hard to achieve financial independence for me now stress adjusted returns are the primary focus how, how would you you know cuz there's, there's a lot of people who listen to the show um you know who are just starting out in their career or possibly even you know still in still in school um what would you say to those people who are just starting out who you know you know don't have much of a, a reputation yet really haven't been able to break into the industry yet what do you, what do you tell those people who who are just starting out who want to build a career and you know one day get back to society what what how, how do you break in it's very good a very good question so basically the again the first key thing is to get started and uh, start off you know with reading as much as you can you know, just even if you can just take small small baby steps if you can just begin reading and learning that's a very good start number 1 and apart from that you know then read all the great you know all the great texts of investing learn from the great investors you know how you know how they uh, behaved what mistakes they made what were their big successes basically learn about all the extreme success and failure patterns i mean that is you know how you you know really really become wiser over time and uh, as with any you know any investing endeavor always remember the three, the three key principles of investing which was taught by benjamin graham long back in the intelligent investor which is number one consider stocks as part ownership in a real business whether you buy one share 10 shares 100 shares or the entire company it's no different you're basically buying a piece of a business that's number one number two treat market fluctuations as your friend you know don't be scared about you know downside volatility if at all you know if uh, something good becomes cheaper then you should add more inculcate the habit of savings this is very important if you just keep saving every month whatever little you can save over time dollar cost averaging works wonders so make use of mr market's mood swings because he sometimes acts very irrational and very emotional and stock prices become very very attractive and this happens almost every single year in fact in the book you know i've actually shown that this does not apply only to small cap and mid cap or micro cap stocks even the me- largest mega cap stocks of the world you know, sometimes fluctuate bit- between 40 and 50% between their 50 to week highs and 50 to week lows so mr market's mood swings affects all areas of the market you just uh, simply note down you know your favorite companies and businesses with having very attractive economic characteristics and just patiently wait i mean investing is a field in which less is more trust me this is one of my biggest <laughs> learnings over the last 10 years this is a field in which success flows from just passively observing the world and reading learning thinking and doing nothing more than making the occasional telephone call to your broker to for making for executing the transaction that's it there's nothing else to it this is like you know watching pain dry or watching grass grow that is what value investing is you just need to be patient that's it and what and, and what advice would you give someone so let's say that you know they they start uh learning those habits getting into that mindset and now they want to you know do this as a full-time career um mm-hmm. in the job searching process to you know start mm-hmm. managing uh capital uh what what advice would you give someone persistence 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 let me share share my own story so this Please. will be i hope uh, this inspires a lot of young people so when i came to america you know four and a half years back that time you know i lacked any formal i had zero formal stock market experience number one i had worked for almost seven years in deutsche bank and city group as an investment banking senior analyst but i had zero formal stock market experience okay 
when i came to america i gave uh, three stock market job interviews in the first six months i got rejected in all three of them failed miserably could not convert a- even a single one of those job stock uh, stock market job interviews okay but like i said in the beginning there is power in passion and pa- passion is what leads to persistence i mean for the over the next uh, 15 months you know what i did was to sustain myself in america and i did not want to sell any single stock from my portfolio of indian stocks because i did not want to disturb the process of compounding so to sustain myself in america i actually took up a minimum wage job as a front desk clerk at a hotel in san francisco and i used to work during the graveyard shift 11 pm at night to 7 am in the morning and during that phase of you know 15 months that is when my learning curve really took off because at at those uh, late nights early mornings the the workflow workflow used to be very very, very slow and i used to get a lot of free time to read and learn in that span i actually finished i read every single blog article on uh, you know fundu professor microcap club safal niveshak janav wordpress blog i read every single blog and i used to take notes and alongside that every single day every single night i in total i used to average around three job applications i used to fill up three stock market job applications online every single day so if you do the math over those 15 months i still remember, distinctly distinctly remember i must have applied to more than 1300 jobs i'm not kidding you wow. at least 1300 1300 jobs okay and eric behind every single job application there is so much hope attached there is so much emotion attached and to face 1300 rejections and still keep on going i mean that just requires i mean a you know very I mean, tremendous amount of resilience and persistence i mean i personally feel resilience is a superpower and uh, you know if you really persist anything is possible anything in life is possible if you really persist and you know uh, and uh, one particular fine night in november 2016 you know i just came across this uh, job application on linkedin and uh, i just uh, clicked on the quick apply button and lo and behold i wonder of wonders i got called for this uh, interview that to for a senior role as a portfolio manager in this investment firm which i work for right now and the very next month i traveled to salt lake city from san francisco for my interview i had three rounds of uh, interview and i guess they just uh, were very impressed by my passion and dedication towards this profession and craft and uh, i was just <laughs> very lucky uh, although i will hum- humbly acknowledge that i was not never expecting to become a portfolio manager so early i was you know expecting to reach this designation after 10 12 years but i mean i just is consider myself very lucky and passion just works wonders and it's all so for you know you go ahead i'm sorry <laughs> Yes, and I'm just uh, you know whenever I look back at those times, you know at those difficult times, I just feel a bit emotional. But because I think what happens is during that particular phase, when you're living life according to the inner scorecard, and when you're just working very hard every single day towards what you believe, believe so, so strongly in. I mean, there'll be so many critics. I mean, the easiest thing in the world to do is to become a critic. I was just I mean, going to ask you, so- did 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 your friends and family think you were kind of crazy, or did they get it? All right, we have you back on. We had a little bit of a connection issue, but not a big deal. So I was asking if, you know, if your friends and family thought you were a little crazy, you know, 15 months and uh you're you're applying to all these jobs and you've you've only been in the United States for four years and you know, what did what did people think? Did you have a lot of critics? Did people just not get it or, you know, explain, tell me tell me about that. I don't blame them. I mean, you know, it's very, you know, difficult to empathize with uh, others in different situations, and especially because I'd come to America without a job in hand. As it is, you know, many friends and family members were very critical of that decision. And on top of that, if they had gotten to know that I was working in a minimum wage job in America and refusing all these uh, lucrative six-figure salary job interviews, which I was getting for investment banking. then they would have simply thought that i've lost my marbles because this is what defines truly passionate people i mean we just you know <clears throat> you know we are the round you know round pegs in the square hole like steve jobs used to say and people just cannot uh, appreciate you know our mindset but i was very f- firmly disciplined in my job search and very focused what i wanted to achieve and uh, thankfully in the end things played out very you know played out pretty well and i'm very thankful for all that happened i mean during those tough times and difficult times is when you get to know who, who you are what you are and you get to learn a lot of good lessons in life so i'm very thankful for those difficult times and uh, i'm all the more wiser for it so i'm very happy you know you were talking earlier where you said resilience is like a superpower and i 
I make the connection between your resilience and your passion and then what we were talking about earlier uh, with with this principle of detachment, right? And just focusing on the process versus mm-hmm. um, trying to chase an outcome. And I think you've right. I think you've lived that really. Yep, I just put in the work every single day. Just fill up the forms as per the standard procedure. Just put in the work, put in the effort, put in the time. I mean, filling up those forms was very tedious and time consuming, but it was just work that had to be done. I mean, in order for serendipity and you know to enter your life, you have to. You know, creates. You know, you could have to create the opportunity, right? For that, the starting step is to put in the work. After that, you know, let the outcome take care of itself. The key is, you know, there is no downside, right? What was the downside here? There was no downside. There was only potential upside. But many people just, you know, don't even want to try, and it just surprises me. I mean, the, in the worst case scenario, you will be where you are right now, the status quo, and in the best case scenario, you will be reaching your dream. It is such a, I mean, this is value investing actually. You know, misplaced gamble. Right. <laughs> this is a misplaced situation. It's just only upside. It's amazing, no it's amazing how how tough it is though for people to think like this. You know. Like this, you know, this this conversation comes easy to me, but the truth is, and I think you understand this, probably to the majority of people just doing their daily thing on the planet, this is not a normal conversation that we're having. You know, this is not a normal way of living life. People are like, so all focused, I, right? People are all so All that I can focused. tell you is, yeah. it's a very fulfilling and happy way to live life. Trust it me. Is, I mean, yeah. when you, you know, when you, you know, find your North Star, that is the guiding force of your life. Let it guide you. And that is, you know, once you, you know what matters the most to you in life and you work towards it every single day, that is such a good feeling, Eric, I tell you. It is such a good feeling. You're always, you know, just, you know, you can't, at night when you sleep, you can't wait, wait to wake up the next day and get to do what you love and love what you do. I mean, that is such a wonderful feeling to have. Trust me. It just makes all the difference i worked for seven years in a job which i did not like and now that every day i'm getting to do what i love to do which is you know to read learn and think and you know analyze businesses industries and companies it's just so much fun i mean life is just fun and why this is so important is that our work fills up a large percentage of our you know know, uh, waking hours right so to find fulfilling work is so so important so so important but to but if you want to reach that particular stage you have to work towards it I worked towards it. I worked towards it for you know fifteen months and the six months before that it took me two years. But fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's a very it's a very inspiring story. And you know, you know, I I knew. I knew I was going to enjoy this conversation with you when we were talking before the show, and I asked you, and I said, you know, are there any things you'd like me to bring up or things you'd like me to ask you and you said no we'll just we'll just you know kind of go with it and and have a free-flowing conversation and you know <laughs> on this podcast that's what i like to do regardless and it's, it's interesting that i'm usually the one that is like hey you know it doesn't have to be some formal interview we'll just have a free you know we'll just roll with it and, and have a a free-form conversation and whatever comes out of it is what comes out of it and we'll just enjoy the conversation and the fact that you were the one bringing it up and, hey you no, know, it's okay just let's just have a good conversation i was like okay i'm gonna like this guy I think I'm at my best when I'm very spontaneous. That's the way I am. Yeah. I just like to, you know, just be very open and frank and just be absolutely open and honest. I mean, there is nothing to hide. Uh, you know, it's, just it's, live. it's yeah. funny yeah. talking about process too, right? It's like, the it's you know, I've never shared this on this podcast before, but the reason I started this podcast is I was kind of bored with a lot of the business. You know, there's, there's not a lot of business podcasts to begin with. And... Mm-hmm. You know, most of them I find kind of boring. And there's a lot of, you know, there's some great ones too, but a lot of them are really boring. And it's like, you know, I could have had you on and be like, we're going to have a, um, you know, and I give you all the credentials, you know, and, and I introduce you. And then, and then it, it comes like this weird formal interview and it's all mechanic mm-hmm. and robotic. Oh, so interesting. Tell me more. <laughs> it's, it's very weird. And, 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 and I think that sometimes, especially in the business world, um, people are so afraid to just authentically express themselves that it becomes this like businessy conversation, right? Where, where it, it, it's literally the, the epitome of being so focused on an outcome where in this case, it's a business conversation outcome that people mm-hmm. kind of get robotic. And, and it's interesting that if, you know, if you meet a lot of these really amazing investors, one of the things that I feel uh, unites a lot of them you know, you bring up guys like, you know, Buffett and Munger, and then you also bring up guys, you know, for instance, you bring up Marcelo Lima, who's been on this podcast before and a, a friend of mine. And, 
just really down to earth guys. And the one thing they all have in common is they're focused on process and not on outcome. And it's a different kind of energy that, 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 that those people have, including you. Yep. Yep. Speaking of Marcelo Lima, just yesterday I watched his, uh, you know, invested day presentation where he talked about exponential organizations like uh, the new age businesses like Google, Amazon, and Facebook, and uh, you know how standard, you know, conventional valuation measures do not really capture the S curve growth paths which these businesses are taking. And it was very, very insightful. Yeah. And just to add to your point about, you know, this authentic, authenticity, you know, one of my all-time favorite quotes, which I've shared in the book as well, is from one of my role models, Guy Spire. In his book, The Education of a Value Investor, he wrote that the true path to success is true authenticity. And that is such a wonderful, wonderful line. I just love that quote. And that is, you know, that says so much. I mean, in the book, there is a chapter I've dedicated to him. It's called, it's titled The Education of a Value Investor, in which I've freely and openly shared all my major investing mistakes. And then I've, you know, examined each of them through the lens of behavioral science. And, you know, some of my friends, you know, during the book writing process, they were like, why do you want to disclose all your mistakes? You know, you'll come across as a bad investor, you know, you know, you know this, that. So I had somebody used to tell them that, you know, as, you know, we should not just, you know, uh, follow our uh, role models in many words. We should embody them in words, action, and spirit. And, you know, if Guy Spire was, you know, so open in you know, acknowledging his vulnerabilities and all his mistakes in his book, and, you know, he was, he's always been so open and humble, you know, when I should emulate the same and do the same. I mean, vicarious learning is one of the best forms of learning. You know, I've been through so many financial and emotional pain. Why do I don't want other people to go through it? That's the, That was the reason why I shared all my mistakes so, so openly in the book. And, you know, I really, you know, respect my mistakes because they made me so much more wiser over the years. The kind of experience and wisdom which they have given me is priceless. But uh, I wish you know, I had uh, embraced uh, vicarious, vicarious learning earlier, then I would have probably sidestepped more, many of those mistakes, but it's fine. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, it's like Charlie Munger says that he likes to learn from dead people. <laughs> True. And read, you know, read biographies of the dead, like Ben Franklin is an example. <laughs> Oh yes, Benjamin Franklin is also one of my role models. So in the book, also there's extensive references to him in yeah, many so chapters. So. Let's talk a little bit about him. How do you, how do you feel some of what he what he shares and some of the Ben Franklin wisdom applies to value investing? Very much. So basically, in the, in the chapter on uh, achieving financial independence, for example, you know he, you know there is one quote uh, by Benjamin Franklin which basically says that beware of small expenses for a small leak can sink a big boat. A big ship, and uh, you know, during my wealth and wealth accumulation and savings phase, you know, I used to just try to save every single dime that I could during that endeavor. I mean, that was the key to compounding. Just to you know, save, you know, save as much as I could, work as hard as I could. And two words, basically, Benjamin Franklin talks about, you know, a lot. He used to talk about these two concepts a lot: industry, which is hard work, and frugality. So basically, these two big ideas I just took to heart and I just applied them in my life. And lo and behold, you know, I just achieved financial independence. And it's really fascinating. There's so much, so, so, so much to learn from him. So much. I mean, he used to basically embody so many good worldly, you know, good life principles. It was very, very inspiring. Very, very inspiring. But, you know, certain daily rituals, you know, and just performing them with full integrity, believing in we the people, you know, having a community feeling, industry and frugality, and... A lot of good life, good attributes to live a good life, and gotten to learn a lot from him. A lot from him. I think you know the biggest, biggest thing in this book, which I've tried to bring out, is that value investing is not just about stocks and business fundamentals. For the truly passionate value investors, the seasoned ones and the experienced ones, you'll observe that they treat it like a life discipline. It's a way of living one's life. I was going to say it's, it's there's a there's a spirituality to the value investing community. It's a it's a it's a real it, it, it's an experience that that impacts you at the level of spirit. Yep. And I, and I think that I don't even want to explain it, but I think just from our conversation, it it speaks to that essence. And it's have you have you been to a Berkshire Hathaway meeting? 
Yes, I've been going there for the last three years. Okay, and awesome. uh, I'm also very happy to inform you know you and your listen your podcast listeners that uh, I've been selected as one of the featured authors at the Berkshire Hathaway book signing event, which will be held in Creighton University in Omaha on the third of May, just one day prior to the Berkshire annual meeting. Well, that's amazing! So, Congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I. I... You know, it's it's so funny when people who have never been to the Berkshire Hathaway meeting, it's mm-hmm. kind of hard to explain why they should come. And <laughs> it, I, I think just this conversation right here speaks speaks to that essence that there's there's this spiritual groundedness. There's a mm-hmm. there's a kind of philosophy that's just embedded in the in the in the fabric of that culture. And when you go there it regrounds you and it, it, you can see all the places where maybe you've, 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 uh, you know, you've swayed a little bit the past year and you're around a community that, that really keeps you grounded. I I mean, I can tell you personally out of any community in my life, the, the value investing community has been by far the most beneficial, uh, to me in my life. And, you know, you talk about concepts like the inner scorecard and and focusing Mm -hmm. on process. And I think it's one thing to, you know, read a book about it and Mm -hmm. obviously you wrote a book about it, but it's, it's a whole other thing when you can be grounded in that, in a community of, you know, actual people. That's very true. In fact, you know, I've talked about, uh, you know, this in the chapter on the importance of having the right associates in life. So, Mm -hmm. Sinjin, just to add to your point about the impact which a Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting has us, has on us value investors, I'll just sum it up in one single line. You get to experience a gravitational pull towards higher qualities. I mean, you know, Warren Buffett has famously said, hang out and interact with people better than you and you cannot improve. And that is what you get to experience every year at the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting. I mean, so many you know, smart, intelligent, wise people just being in the presence has an incredible impact on, you know, the true, the truly curious and uh, humble person i mean you just want to imbibe all those good qualities as much as you as you can you know just you know just take up all the good qualities that you can from all those wise people that's what i love most about this annual meeting yeah. and all of them and you'll also notice one more thing most of those in fact majority if not all of them are so so humble and so so helpful i mean you know they have been greatly beneficial in, in my life so greatly greatly beneficial and those relationships, then they really tend to endure for a long period of time. And it's not about money; it's just about, you know, being in the company of good people. That's it. You know, so I'm a little mind blown right now, just because. So I've been going for the. This will be my 14th year in a row going, and mm-hmm. what you just said explains more eloquently than I've ever explained it to anyone why they should come to a Berkshire Hathaway meeting. To the point where if someone's like, hey, you know, that, that thing in Omaha you go to, and I know you wanted me to come, why do you think I should come? I'm just going to play them that little clip of the podcast because it's so beautiful mm-hmm. what you just said. So they, actually, they, so thank you for saying that. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Wow, this is, you're, you're, you're a fascinating individual. Um, is, there, is, there any, is there anything else that you, you think, um, you know, big takeaways from your book, any other principles that you'd like to discuss? I think I'll just leave that for the readers to, you know, enjoy when they read it. But, uh, the you know, the key message for the readers would be, you know, just, uh, you know, share all your learnings with your, friend, with your friends and colleagues and just help other people rise in life as, as much as possible. I think that is the way goodwill compounds over time. And uh, that is something which no one can take away from you. You know, a good uh, reputation, goodwill, you know, respect, trust, admiration. These need to be earned. And uh, the only way to do that is through your actions. Just be a good human being and just help other people rise in life. That's it. Yeah. You know, once you've done well for yourself, then do devote some time to helping other people as well. That's my only message. Well, I, I really appreciate you coming on. And, um, you know, to the listeners, I have to say your your, your book was fantastic. I, ha- I had the opportunity to read it this weekend. Um, your book is now available for uh, pre-order on Amazon. Um, mm-hmm. When's the official release date of your book? So it's next Thursday. It is 25th of April. 25th of April. And they can pre-order on Amazon right now. Is that correct? Yes, and uh, for USA based for USA based readers, they can pre-order it on Barnes and Noble, 
Okay. Books a million and indie bound because right now Amazon USA has stopped the pre-orders for for the moment. Oh wow. Okay. Okay. So what I'll do from you is I'll I'll if you could email me maybe some links and I could put that in the show notes for people if they want to uh, order your book. I'll do that, Eric. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It was it was a real pleasure talking to you. Same here, Eric. And, thank you uh, so much. And I, I hope to meet you in Omaha this year. Absolutely. <laughs> we'll definitely catch up. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, and uh, have a great rest of your evening. Thank you, Eric. All right, take care. Thank you for listening to the Intelligent Investing Podcast with Eric Schlein. If you'd like to connect with Eric for questions, comments, feedback, ideas, or to inquire about being on the show, please contact Eric at intelligentinvesting at gmail.com. So, in the words of Charlie Munger, I have nothing to add. <laughs>